Hello everyone. Uh, today we have in our studio uh, the one and only GM Swapnil Dopare, uh, also known as the Swiss King in India. Yeah. <laughs> Swapnil has recently won a lot of tournaments in India and uh, today we have the great privilege of him being in Mumbai. Uh, Swapnil, so why are you in the town today in Mumbai? Basically, I have to apply for visa, Schengen visa here. And planning uh, three tournaments in Europe this December. So for visa purpose, I have to go to the embassy for procedures and all. So that's why I'm here. So Swapnil has stopped by the Chess Base India studio, and uh, we are going to do something today. So Swapnil, can you tell us what uh, are you planning to show to our viewers? Uh, today I will. I would like to show one of my games of uh, this Abu Dhabi Chess tournament I uh, just played this year. Okay. Uh, it was the first round. Uh, playing against uh, R Ashwat of India and uh, okay usually I play D4 so this it was the first round so I thought maybe I will play something different so I started with Knight F3 okay so this was uh, played in the Abu Dhabi Open uh, and yeah. it was the first round so uh, and it was a very big tournament yes, yes so how do you usually go about first round opponents because you don't usually get the pairing mm -hmm. before the round so how do you prepare yourself? You get it like 10 minutes before the game. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it depends mainly on my mood, like uh, what kind of game I want to play uh, at, on, on that day. So, and uh, yeah, okay, even if I, uh, if we get uh, up the pairing 10 minutes earlier, we still know something about our opponents, you know, because we uh, keep playing them, uh, keep seeing them uh, in uh, some other tournaments and all. So basically, we have some idea about uh, what opening they play so on the on that uh, i think we can easily decide uh, what uh, should what openings we should choose okay so r ashwat was your opponent in the first round and what was your assessment of him uh, as an opponent well basically the first thing that came to my mind was that uh, he has not played uh, he's not playing uh, tournaments regularly uh, he had taken a gap from chess uh, i think uh, some one uh, two or three years and uh, he has, uh, after that uh, he has started playing chess now. Okay. So I thought I will play some uh, some system which uh, um, maybe I had never played before because I thought uh, on that day I, I think uh, the pairing came quite early. So like uh, I think in the morning the pairing came and the round was the match was in the afternoon. So I thought he will get some time to prepare. So um, I, I thought I will, I will choose some uh, line which I haven't played uh, much. So you wanted to play a fresh game, yeah. uh, non-theoretical battle. Yes, yes, right. But you yourself are a theoretical expert. No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, I work on openings, but obviously I don't think so. I'm really an expert. Okay. I prefer to play, uh, get some good playable positions on the board, and then I uh, put all my energy in the middle game and the end game. Okay. So you started off with knight f3. Yeah. Uh, this keeps it open to transpose into d4 or c4. Yeah. So, uh, what did he play? He played uh, d5, g3, nf6, bishop g2, c6, c4. So, now you made a decision that you would like to keep it in English territory, yeah, sort yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. So well, basically, I had analyzed this position, this opening with uh, the black pieces because I play the same setup with the black pieces as well. So and I don't have any special preparation with the white side of this opening. But uh, if you analyze an opening, I think if you analyze an opening uh, with uh, any color, I think uh, you can play it uh, with opposite color as well. Okay. Uh, I mean, I was playing in the MCL in the same team as Sashi Kiran. Yeah. And he told that. You should always analyze an opening from white's point of view, okay. uh, so that if you get an advantage, you play it as white, mm -hmm. and if you are unable to find an advantage, you play that same line as black. Mm -hmm. uh, That's a nice idea. <laughs> do you do you agree with this? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great idea. Yeah. So in this line, uh, you think that black is solid? Yeah, obviously. Okay. So DC four is my uh, opponent played DC four, and that is uh, I think a very interesting option. Obviously, black has other options as well. You can play bishop f5 or bishop g4. Both are main lines. Okay, bishop f5 is possible and bishop g4. Bishop g4. I think these two lines are more solid than dc4. dc4 is like uh, an open battle. It's very interesting and uh, some positions are quite dynamic here. Okay. 
so he took the pawn and it's kind of a gambit yeah, yeah obviously because uh, if you try to recover your pawn let's say by a move like queen c2 mm -hmm. he he will still yeah he will still uh, he will play b5 or i think yeah he, he will play b5 here he can still hang on to the pawn exactly so you didn't go for this mm -hmm. and uh, instead you played castles castles so were you already gearing up for some kind of a uh, a uh, sacrificial game or something yeah i was expecting to, uh, for him to defend the pawn and he was also thinking and playing so yeah i think it was a bit of surprise for him um yeah i had some interesting idea prepared some interesting pawn sacrifice uh, later on in this game okay uh, but i expected that uh, uh, expected the main line at bd7 here this is the main move yeah. in the position mm -hmm. okay yeah and i think uh, now queen c2 knight b6 Knight a3, bishop e6. Now here is an interesting option, knight e5. Okay. Queen d4. Knight c6. B c6. Bishop wow. c6. So this is like a, yeah. some kind of a very crazy line. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, to play this line over the board very well, you also need to analyze it at home quite uh, well. So tell me something, you are a hardcore d4 player, yeah. most of the times you play d4. This is uh, some kind of an English territory or Reti territory. Mm -hmm. How have you analyzed this position also in such depth? Like no, Basically I analyzed this position with the black side and I ah. thought that uh, uh, it's also, it's interesting basically, uh, the position is quite unclear. So I thought I can also uh, try it out some uh, at some point with the white pieces as well. So there was uh, some saying by Botwinik who said that you must never repeat your openings, uh, you know, they should not overlap yeah, yeah. something like, for example, if you play the Rai Lopez with white, then you must try to avoid something like E4, E5 with black so that they don't overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, but you seem to contradict that. Yeah, <laughs> I think everyone has different opinions and uh, nowadays you can see all the players play all the openings. So. I think the times have changed maybe. <laughs> yes, sure. The times have changed and uh, I think here you could have been much better prepared than your opponent yeah, in yeah, this obviously. particular position. Okay, so you went castles yeah. and he didn't play the main line with knight bd7. So I played b5 here. b5, now I played a4. Okay. It should be 7 and now here, okay, these are the natural moves if uh, someone does not know theory, I think uh, they will all obviously think to defend upon with b5 and play bishop b7 next. Yes. So I expected uh, this as well. And here I had uh, an interesting pawn sacrifice prepared. Obviously it has been played before, but uh, not many games in this move now, d3. Okay. D3. Yeah. I, I usually find that uh, in such positions the pawn sacrifice is B3. Yeah, yeah. That is like the natural pawn sacrifice. Uh, this is a typical Catalan's pawn sacrifice. Exactly. I think it's even uh, fine in this position as well. But D3 is simply much more stronger, I feel, in this exact position. And why do you, do you think I so? think this opens uh, many lines for the white pieces. And uh, also in many variations this knight can uh, up to let's say CD3. Yeah, the bishop is opening and uh, after cd3, the white knight can go from d2 to b3 as well. So b3 square is straight for the knight as well. And trying to exploit that c5 square. So and this is the key square. Yeah, that is the key square. So also at some point, let's say if the queen gets exchanged on the d5, the knight can also go to a5, which is very irritating for the bishop on b7 and also it pressurizes pawn on c6. Oh, okay. So if uh, someone doesn't know this, uh, ideas he would naturally put his knight on c3, c3 exactly but the best part is knight d2 knight b3 that's mm, yeah okay so he your opponent after d3 took the pawn yeah i think uh, yeah i think uh, anand played b4 here with black pieces but even that uh, doesn't seem so good uh, this was i think the game uh, between anand and some uh, someone in Petrosian. World Rapid. Yeah, Digan yeah. Petrosian. It was in World Rapid and Anand did B4. But My, uh, Petrosian played Knight E5, which was also fine, but I think even simple DC4 should have been slight pulled for white at least. Yeah, this looks like uh, after Queen D1, Rook D1, at least small edge. Yeah, for some white. small edge. Because then basically the main thing is that the Knight can go to B3 and Knight can pressure a lot of uh, space on the Queen side, E5, C5. 
Yeah. Okay. But in the game, your opponent took the pawn on d3. Yeah. Uh, I think he also did not expect my next move, maybe knight e5. So the knight jumps right in the center of the board. Yeah. Uh, and what is the idea behind this move? Obviously, uh, the main thing is that I want to take with the knight on uh, with the pawn on d3 with the knight. So knight d3. And also, I mean, uh, there are some threats like ab5 is threatened and uh, the f7 is under pressure. So uh, there are also some other ideas as well. Quite a multi-purpose move, yeah. uh, knight e5. And uh, the natural question to ask is, what happens after d takes e2? I think uh, even if you simply take queen into e2, white should be better because the b5 is hanging and the black uh, basically black is completely behind in development so uh, even for the two pawns i think white has simply too much of initiative but here i think uh, instead of queen e2 white can also take queen d8 king d8 to e1 and then the b5 ab5 is a threat and knight f7 is a threat as well plus the rook uh, that e2 pawn will also fall so i think white is simply better here Okay. Yeah, this looks like excellent compensation for one. Yeah. Uh, so he didn't take the pawn on e2 over here. Yeah. He and uh, instead he went he, for he went for queen c7. Attacking the knight on e5. Yeah. Even one point I want to show is that uh, instead of queen c7, if he plays e6, mm -hmm. uh, white can even think of taking uh, the d3 pawn with the queen and exchange, go for the exchange of queens. Wow. So queen d3, knight d3. And now the now the idea comes uh, into uh, like I can play knight d2, knight b3. So now you're going to go this way and put your knight on c5, a5, a5 or c5. Or a5 or c5. Yeah, yeah. Right now the b5 pawn is hanging, so let's say he plays something like a6. a6. Yeah. Now I can play knight d2. Knight d2, knight b7, knight say. b3. So again he's not getting the c5 move here because the b7 is hanging. And uh, obviously, I can also put my bishop on e3 uh, or the knight on e5. So basically, white has a lot of ideas. And this ending, I'm, I think, should be at least slight h4 white, or maybe even clear better. Guys, this is a uh, high-class positional chess. You know, uh, you sacrifice a pawn for an attack is understood, but when you sacrifice a pawn for bind on the position in a queenless middle game, uh, that's something really difficult. And uh, I think uh, after some things like bishop e3 or rook c1, yeah. white is going to have a lot of pressure. Exactly. Okay, so he didn't uh, want to go into this end game. And so after the move knight e5, he, he went for queen c7. Now I took knight d3. Okay, we took the pawn. Yeah, now I think he played e5. Yeah. E5, yeah. Because I think you are threatening bishop to f4 already here. Yeah. So e5 is trying to stop that. Yeah. So also is opening the bishop yeah, but and trying to castle. But, but if you play uh, e5 here, maybe you lose a pawn, right? After a b5. A b5, c b5. Bishop b7, queen b7, b7 and knight e5. Yeah, but now I think simply like let's say bishop e7 and then castles. Yeah, it's possible, but. Uh, do you think he played that or first knight bd7? I think he played first knight bd7, yeah. Yeah, I think he... So for bishop, he has e5 next. Right. So, knight goes to d7 and if bishop f4, now e5. e5 is possible. Okay. So I played knight c3. Uh, one small point which I would like to make here is that you can see the 10 moves of the opening are over and what Swapnil has essentially done is brought each and every piece of his into the game. Like he has castled his king, he has his bishop nicely placed, the knights are out in the center and the bishop is coming out somewhere. So overall, this is excellent opening play. Yeah. I think white is simply simply has a great initiative after the opening. Right. And that's also just for a pawn, so it's quite good. Nothing much to mm -hmm. worry about. Okay. And here your opponent played e5. He, he gave that uh, b5 pawn back, but I think uh, he should have somehow tried to hold it. Maybe play b4 or something. But even b4, just uh, oh, b4 you can just take. Yeah, you can just. But take. maybe you can play a6 and then somehow hold to that pawn. But even after 
yeah you can just take so a6 maybe and for now uh, even now i think white can win a pawn with a b5 mm -hmm. cb5 knight b5 yeah. and after a b5 okay, you take check. this bishop a8 which should be better for white okay, because so of the two better. bishops two bishops and also that b5 pawn is a bit weak and black is still behind in development okay so maybe all, uh, or maybe he should have taken b into a4 at least Ah, uh, not here. Uh, yeah, here. here BA4. I was expecting this move and I thought maybe I'll take with the queen or maybe all the options are quite comfortable for, uh, for white. Even taking it with the knight is also okay and then trying to climb down that on that C5 square. So you take with the knight and you put your pieces on C5. C5, yeah. We should be 3 and uh, knight C5 or something. Okay. So overall you are quite comfortable, yeah. uh, but after e5, he has given you the b5 pawn. Yeah, after e5 I felt that something is wrong with the black position because uh, I am simply getting my pieces on active squares and uh, I thought I can somehow exploit the weak, uh, the king position on e8. So what did you continue with? I took the pawn obviously, a b5, b5. c5 b5, and add b5 first, queen b6, bishop into b7, queen into b7. So here, uh, I so have I, to make it. I think this is a critical position exactly, yeah. in the game because I, I think White has to play energetically here to uh, uh, continue the initiative very well. Yeah. So if you give some two moves to Black after, let's say Bishop E7 and, and Castle, castle yeah. he would be comfortable, clearly comfortable. Exactly. And so the task for the viewers here is to find something. Yeah to find the best move in this position so that uh, you give uh, problems so black and not uh, allow him to develop freely and castle uh, in, in the next move like bishop is no castles okay so i would request all those who are watching this uh, to pause your video and try to find a good move for white and we are going to do this now from i think every move because exactly. every move is critical at this point and if you can do this and try to train yourself like Swapnil did then you might be able to learn the art of playing uh, with initiative exactly. because white has the initiative here and any quiet moves will ruin that exactly each and every move comes okay so what did you do here uh, and how did you make a threat okay basically i also thought a bit prophylactically here uh, obviously the plan is bishop is in castle so i tried to somehow stop that thing mm -hmm. uh, so i played queen a4 here so queen to a4 yeah the main idea is that now black cannot play bishop e7 because i can take the e5 pawn with knight e5 and now black cannot recapture it back with knight e5 because of knight d6 and he loses the queen exactly you said some some word like prophylaxis, yeah. uh, which is quite alien to many of the people. Uh, what does that exactly mean, and how how does one think prophylactically? Uh, basically, it's uh, um, what I can say is that uh, uh, we need to ask our, uh, ourselves ourselves uh, a question that what uh, my opponent wants to do uh, in this exact position or uh, what would my opponent play if uh, he is to move so uh, this is uh, at first when you are training i think you need to ask this question uh, consciously but uh, when you train a lot uh, with uh, uh, with prophylactic uh, prophylactical thinking i think uh, this uh, habit uh, comes into into our intuition mm -hmm. and uh, suddenly at uh, you will uh, see that uh, in uh, you can use this prophylactic thinking in a lot of uh, positions even let's say uh, it's connected with positional play most of the times so prophylactic thinking but even uh, even in this position where uh, each and every move counts uh, where it's a very dynamic position you can also use this prophylactic thinking even in such positions okay so you mean to say that the question needs to be consciously asked at first yeah. what does my opponent need to do and did you ask that every time earlier when you were not so good at prophylaxis? No, obviously I did not uh, ask that uh, those questions earlier and then uh, I found that I lost many plus positions because I used to miss my opponent's counterplay or my opponent's ideas. 
then I figured it out that maybe this is my weakness and then I uh, worked with Dorotsky's books basically. Uh, he is a master of prophylaxis I think and uh, he has assisted a lot of, yeah, he has given a lot of uh, great material on prophylaxis. Then I assist, I worked with his, with, with his material and then uh, slowly I, I started improving in this area. Uh, any particular book that covers this theme of prophylaxis? I think Dorotsky's uh, book on positional play also covers the theme of prophylaxis. Also, he has recently published some new books. Yes, uh, the recognizing opponents resources. resources. Exactly, I worked with that book as well, and uh, so I, I improved a lot in this area. I think. So, uh, prophylaxis. If you can always ask what your opponent's threat is that would be excellent and it should become so natural to you that you no longer have to ask that question exactly suddenly we start uh, seeing the opponent uh, moves and resources okay so here swapnil went queen a4 stopping bishop e7 yeah and uh, ashwath had a decision to make exactly so he chose to play e4 here attacking the knight exactly now I think the viewers can again think for themselves uh, what should white play on the next move. It's white to play and uh, remember that there is no time to be wasted because once again if you ask yourself what is my opponent going to do, he's just going to play bishop, bishop, bishop and castles, yeah. So here I played knight e5. Knight to e5? Wow. And just a, uh, an inter uh, question is is this move possible, bishop to f4? Because you're developing a piece and it looks like a typical move uh, in you know, giving up some material. Exactly. I think even this was a possibility. I, I, also, remember, I also remember considering this during the game. But uh, maybe I was not sure about something. Maybe it was e into d3. Okay, e d3. Knight maybe c7 knight. check. Maybe king d8. Knight into a8. Queen uh, into a8. Or maybe I think this is simply better as well. Yes, but I don't want to exchange the queens with queen into a7. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe uh, we can try rook d1, but then d into e2. So this looks good, uh, I would say, but it was not very concrete. Exactly. Uh, you didn't find a clear cut way to continue. Yeah, and then I compared it with knight e5, and I thought knight e5 is simply much better. Maybe, maybe even this is also fine, but. Over the board, I thought 95 is simply much better. So what's the new threat now? Because he's just he could just play something like bishop e7. Yeah, so he, that's what he played in the game and I was expecting that. Because now I had something interesting prepared for this. I took mm -hmm. knight into d7. Okay, knight d7, knight d7 and you had something already prepared yeah, here. this position. This is I think the critical position of the game. Because black just needs one move to castle. And then it is fine, I guess. Okay, if I think over here as a, a fresh spectator, mm -hmm. seeing the position for the first time, I cannot really find a way to stop black from castling. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, you would look at moves like rook d1. Exactly, here. and then he simply castles knight. And castling. And there is no discovered attack which could help you. Exactly. And this is the way I started uh, looking for moves. I started with rook d1 and then I thought I am simply getting nothing in this position. Okay. Any other move that you considered here? Before? Yeah, I also considered bishop f4 I think. And then castles, knight c7. And then try to win that a7 pawn. Yes. Then he takes on b2. So I was also not so much impressed by that. Right now the knight on d7 is hanging so but yeah. I think maybe knight c5 yeah, can even also knight c5 is come in. Yeah, yeah. Or even if he plays rook d8 I think. But okay, knight c5 is simply better. Yeah, knight c5 and uh, white has lost almost all his edge. Exactly. Uh, what you can see from this is that your advantage is very, very uh, fickle in nature. Yeah. It could just go away in one move. Yeah. Either you get everything or you get nothing maybe. So the, this is a very big pressure situation. Yeah, exactly. But okay, I had prepared this idea 2-3 moves before when, when playing knight e5, so that's why I went for this position. Okay, so you had already seen it. Yeah. And so, all those who haven't found the move yet, you have a chance. Uh, try to pause the video and find it. It's a very nice idea, which Swapnil is now going to tell you. So here I played bishop g5, 
bishop to g5 so again stopping castling yeah stopping castling and the bishop can not be taken yeah because the queen is hanging knight d6 check. yeah uh so obviously cannot castle and the bishop has no good squares remaining uh, let's see if we if we play bishop to c5 or something uh, but just a, a question like ah you say bishop to c5 okay yeah, something like this i think uh, I, ha i can at least play at pawn to b4 mm -hmm. so again the bishop has and he's in trouble trouble yeah big trouble over here and i had a question what if he just moves his knight to c5 i mean there is a discovered check coming but the queen will also be attacked so uh, but i think you can just win here yeah? uh, you can win a piece maybe knight d6 check king f8 yeah just uh, knight b7 knight a4 bishop b7 king e7 and rook a4 so this doesn't work at all yeah so does knight b6 also doesn't work yeah the same reason he had to play something yeah he played f6 here so again is planning to castle okay now i play rook f c1 well the you, the ease with which you say the move is not so easy i played rook f c1 but it's a, it's a complicated move yeah but i think this is the way you need to play in this position i think uh, when you went for the these complications you had already seen this exactly yeah So, where, from which point onwards had you seen this uh, idea with bishop g5, rook f c1? Exactly. I think uh, when I played queen a4, I wow. saw that uh, for e4 I have knight e5 for bishop e7. I take take and play bishop g5 for f6. I play rook f c1. So, so that was move number 14, 14 exactly. and this is move number 18. So you had seen already four moves ahead. Yeah. Okay. And as of this position, I thought that uh, white spreads are too much to vary. I think white will uh, win this position. So uh, first question is, what do you do if he takes your? I think knight c7 is a simple solution for this. But obviously there are other moves. King d8. Now maybe just take on eight. Maybe. But, uh, also, I was wondering if knight uh, yeah. d6 take and. Maybe rook c6. Knight e6 is possible, but you take this. Queen, Queen takes. takes. And rook d1 or something. Yeah, like? rook d1 and then just double maybe. Should be winning. Or even Queen a7 here. Yeah. Or even Queen a7. Uh, and this will just win yeah. the piece. So this uh, is a clear indication of how. his undeveloped pieces are coming into big trouble exactly so he can't play fg5 fg5 so i think he he castled and now i played uh, rook c7 queen b6 well maybe i can just take rook d7 here and then f into g5 rook into e7 queen f to check king h1 queen into e2 and then maybe yeah but this was a bit uh, maybe queen b3 check yeah queen b3 check but uh, you know black always has some threats like rook f2 or something or rook f1 even so i, I didn't feel so comfortable playing this position mm, so i thought maybe i can do something much better in that position uh one thing that we can learn from this is how uh, players of swapnil's caliber are always alert for uh, opponent's counterplay for example here too he was a piece up but uh, there was counterplay on yeah. the f2 point so you rejected this line yeah yeah i thought maybe i will i, I should try to find something better which does not allow my opponent any, any counterplay so that's why i played queen c4 check here You could play just bishop e3 attacking the yeah, queen. Yeah, but I thought then queen e6 and then it depends everything. And then the queen is defending the knight and it, it looks yeah, okay. Yeah, it looks okay. So that's why I played first queen c4 check, taking away that e6 square from the queen. Mm-hmm. And he played king h8 and now bishop e3. And, and funnily, the queen has no square. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the queen can't go to c6 or. 
D6, E6, A6, A5. A6. It's like the queen is trapped, yeah? Yeah, yeah. the only square is B8, but yeah. then I simply collect the piece on D7. Right, so he went for knight E5. Yeah, he went for knight E5. Now I played queen D5. So my main idea was obviously to cover uh, cover all the squares for the black queen. So he played rook D8. And now the e7 bishop is hanging, so he has to keep continuing uh, the attack on the queen. queen. Yeah, now I took queen into e5. And with it, I think white wins a piece. Yeah, white wins a piece because queen into e3 will be met with just f3 or even queen yeah, e7. Yeah, even queen e7. And uh, white is up a piece. Yeah. And you won the game. Yeah, here is the end of queen e5. So after queen takes e5, Ashwath resigned and uh, it was a very nice uh, game. Yeah, thank you. Uh, wh what exactly uh, was the main feature you think in this game that we just saw? I think uh, in the opening white uh, black wasted a lot of moves uh, grabbing the pawns and they should have uh, tried to complete a development uh, even after grabbing one pawn. Uh, but also he gave that b5 pawn free of cost. So I think uh, that was a big mistake. After that, I think the initiative was too much to handle. Yes, and I have a personal feeling that the most important position of the game was this one. Yeah. Uh, without doubt. And uh, from this point onwards, the energy with which you played was uh, really good. Yeah. Really amazing. Uh, is it true that good players know when exactly it's the critical moment in the game? Yeah, obviously, I think uh, it's uh, basically an intuitive feel uh, that maybe this position is something which uh, might change the course of the game. So, uh, good players try to invest a lot of time in such critical positions because uh, the next few moves after those uh, aren't maybe so important, but th that exact position is very important. Uh, so, we need to invest uh, some time into such positions so that uh, the uh, upcoming moves will be quite easy to play. But is there any way you can develop this intuitive feel of which position is critical and which is not? Uh, basically, we have to solve a lot of different positions uh, during our training. Uh, it can be a positions based on initiative, positions uh, based on positional play, prophylaxis. So different kind of things we need to keep solving uh, to develop this feeling for critical positions. Yes, and once you do that, I think uh, it would be highly useful in your games because you would know exactly when to think and when to play quickly. Exactly, yeah. That's right. And that's what Grandmasters do. And Swapnil, thanks a lot for this game. Uh, you're going to the visa consulate now uh, to get your Spanish visa. Schengen visa. Schengen visa. Uh, and uh, which tournaments would you be playing? I'm playing uh, three tournaments in December. The first one is in Italy, Rome. The second one is in Spain. Yes, and the third one is the Rilton Cup in Sweden. Okay, so three tournaments in a row. Yeah. Uh, you are you are well known to uh, win back-to-back -back tournaments in India in 2016. Uh, how many tournaments did you win? I don't really remember, but uh, obviously some tournaments. Yeah, I think he won nearly four to five tournaments in India. Very strong rating tournaments. So is this like now I have conquered India? Now I should go outside <laughs> India? So basically, <laughs> I have been playing in India since my childhood. I mean, comparatively, I played a lot of tournaments. Uh, even after becoming a grandmaster, I played a lot of tournaments in India. I completed my grandmaster norms in India as well. So I did. I feel I did not play much European tournaments. So now I have decided to play more tournaments in Europe. And you want to now beat the big guys like 2600 plus? Yeah, that's my intention. But okay, let's see. I will try my best. Okay, we wish you all the best, Swapnil, and uh, see you soon again for a new lecture for our viewers. Thank you, surely.